Thank you, Dr. Fischerberg and Dr. Robinson for inviting me to speak about this very important topic on uh, fires in the operating room, their prevention and management. So I have no pertinent disclosures for this uh, discussion and these are our objectives. We're going to talk about fires in the operating room, why do they occur, how do we prevent them from occurring, and what do we actually do when a fire happens in the operating room. So this is a scary situation that no one wants to be in, and it is very rare and extremely preventable. And uh, it unfortunately does occur in patients that under undergo sometimes very minor head and neck procedures often under conscious sedation with supplemental oxygen being used in the room. And I'm going to discuss how to prevent this. So despite the fact that the um, root causes of OR fires are very known and delineated, they still occur, and these are the fire statistics. Estimated 550 to 650 fires in the operating room per year. This is equivalent to wrong site surgery. This is very significant, and this is a, a statistic from the ECRI Institute from 2009. Most of these fires are minor and result in no injury to the patient. However, there's 20 to 30 preventable serious um, incidents with disfiguring and disabling injuries to our patients with two to five preventable deaths per year. These are significant numbers. This is a typical case report. Patient undergoing minor facial surgery, perhaps an excision of a mole. Um, this is, uh, there's an alcohol-based prep use, perhaps iodine allergy is reported in the patient. There is oxygen delivered by nasal prongs to the patient open source of oxygen. And cloth towels or full drape is used for sterile technique. An electrosurgical device is used to excise a lesion. And a spark is observed in the field, and this is what happens. A flash beneath the drapes from the oxygen accumulating underneath the drapes. This is a very scary situation. Sometimes you can't even see the flame because an alcohol prep-based solution is used, and um, oftentimes the fire is quickly extinguished. It's smothered, and the drapes are pulled off the, pati off the patient. However, this is what happens. Patients still sustain significant second degree burns to their face or upper chest area. And it's, this has received significant public attention in the news and in the media. This is from the NBC Today Show, in November 2011. Even as recently, I was looking in the news, March 2nd, 2016, just this month, patients report suffering severe burns from fires during surgery. This is from NBC Washington in the DC area. The number of patients, this lady underwent thyroid surgery in 2011. Again, fire from electrosurgical source and many surgeries later and a lawsuit, she reported this and there was an editorial about her story. So a significant issue. And a number of healthcare organizations have undertaken this as um, an, op an opportunity to raise awareness about fires in the operating room, develop educational strategies to um, prevent um, OR fires. The FDA has taken it as a major initiative uh, in safety for our patients, and hence the FUSE course focuses on fire prevention. Now, if there's anything I want you to take away from this talk, this is the only important slide here, okay? There's three things, three things that are required to, for a fire to happen. An oxidizer, an ignition source, and fuel. And, of course, the three members of the surgical team. The oxidizer is the oxygen or the nitrous oxide that the anesthesia provider um, uses to um, anesthetize the patient. Ignition sources, surgeons use electrosurgical devices and lasers and other sources. So that's number two. Number three, fuel. Some things burn more quickly when oxygen is present. Some, of, some drapes and prepping agents don't burn when there is air use. However, when there's supplemental oxygen used, they are more flammable. So oxidizers, ignition source, and fuel. 
and prevention requires a team approach of anesthesia, surgeons, and nurses in the operating room. This is the major slide. Oxygen-rich environment, those are the common causes of fires. 75% of ore fires occur when there's open source of oxygen present. Alcohol-based prep solutions, 4% of ore fires occurred when there was alcohol used for a prep solution. And igniters, electrocautery was used in 70% of the cases of ORA fires, lasers in 10%, light sources, defibrillators, and high-speed burrs in the rest of 20%. Where do the fires occur? They can happen anywhere on the patient's body, even if you're working in the head and neck area, but those are the most common, and in the airway and anywhere else on the patient. 21% occur in the airway itself. This is a very scary situation. How do we prevent this? I'm gonna to talk to you about prevention now. So the three, I'm gonna address the three parts of the triangle sequentially. Oxidizers, minimize the use of open oxygen in the operating room. Consider the use of LMA or intubating the patient under um, any circumstances when head and neck surgery is required or keep the oxygen saturation concentration below 30%. Communication is very key between the anesthesia provider and the surgeon using the uh, potentially, uh, potential igniter when greater than 30% of oxygen needs to be used. Remember that two liters per minute in the cannula is already, um, in nasal prongs, is already greater than 30% um, of oxygen. When working on tracheostomy cases, cold instruments need to be used to cut tracheal rings and enter the airway. People know this, but still fires do occur in those circumstances. This is a picture of a fire tracking up the ET tube. No one wants the ha that to happen. In that case, saline needs to be poured down into the um, ET tube and the patient needs to be extubated. This is a dangerous situation of fire in the endotracheal tube. Supplemental oxygen, again, think twice. Control oxygen delivery. There are blenders that can use room air and oxygen to provide a safer environment. We were trying to avoid the concentration of oxygen um, increasing under the drapes. And communication, again, is critical if FiO2 needs to be greater than 30%. Fuel. Almost anything will burn when there's oxygen around. Beware of alcohol preps. Again, this is um, very common. Most hospitals, we have a three-minute rule before draping the patient. Make sure that there's dry prep uh, before draping the patients. There's no areas with pooled alcohol on the field. Um, fire, uh, alcohol-based fire, again, is hard to see. It often has a blue flame and may not be initially noticed. The third part, igniters always control any electrically powered devices on the field. The light sources need to be on standby before every case. The light source needs to be off before disconnecting it at the end of the case from the camera. And use holsters for all energy devices. The electrosurgery devices need to be activated only when the tip is in view and deactivated before the tip leaves the surgical field. Place the electrosurgical device in the holster when not in use, and never use covering shields or rubber sleeves over these um, electrosurgical pencils. So prevention in a nutshell. Discuss fire risk at the team briefing at the beginning of the case. Very critical communication again. Avoid oxygen enrichment. Less than 30% of oxygen needs to be used in cases. Use wet sponges. Sterile water or saline needs to be available on the back table or nearby and syringe with saline on hand for oral procedures. Use the lowest possible setting on energy devices and um, I, this, these are very simple rules to follow and yet fires still happen in the operating room. What to do? Next, if a fire happens, are we prepared? Do we know what the steps are of how to react? This is what to do. 
The main thing is to stop flow of all airway gases to patients, including extubating the patient. If airway fire occurs, pour saline into the AT tube and extubate the patient. Immediately remove burning materials from the patient and extinguish the fire on the burning materials. Care for the patient, restore breathing, and manage patient injuries. Now, nowhere it does it say that we need to use fire extinguisher in initially in a fire situation, and that is correct. Um, most of the time, the fire extinguisher is rarely used in fire situations on the patient. Um, and uh, CO2 fire extinguishers uh, need to be used in those circumstances. In disastrous or extreme circumstances, this is a useful mnemonic to remember. Brace, the, this, these are of course rare circumstances, but um, this is uh, an easy thing to remember. Rescue, attempt to rescue the patient from fire in the operating room. Alert the nearby staff, activate the fire alarm, and call the fire department. C, confine, isolate the room, shut off the medical gas valves, and um, sh shut off the electrical power to the room. Evacuate, evacuate the incident room, and if necessary, the entire surgical suite. These are pretty rare circumstances. Now, I want you to watch this video and think about how you would react in this situation, knowing all the things that we've discussed right now. Oh, can I have the video, please? It didn't actually go. Can you make the full screen and the voice? Fire! Fire! Get the oxygen off. Disconnect. Get the drapes off. Or saline. I'll get the extinguisher. I'm concerned about an airway burn. I think I'm going to intubate the patient. Okay. Thank you. Use team training in your institution to know how to react. These things happen very quickly, and it's scary when it occurs. These are my resources about OR fires. Thank you for your attention.